The text that we had read today, the text I've learned and had in my mind for many, many years, the Bible says, Whatsoever men be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever men soweth, that shall he also reap. When we go to our gardening, most people, I won't say most, maybe, a good number of people likes gardening. I do. I haven't grown very much lately. Hope to do so and then when I get to the point where they say you're retired. And I was mentioning that term yesterday and someone's past you can't retire. So I, everybody else does, but until that time, but I like gardening. And I've learned that if I plant peas, I don't get radishes. If I plant corn, I can't reap watermelons. I reap what I sow. Paul used that analysis to help us to understand that there are consequences to all the choices that we make. God would want us to understand that very much so. Some people don't understand that. And so I'm reading through several different materials, and I was reading through the volume 5 of the testimonies section called the warning. Mrs. White was shown a case of a brother, and she said this to Brother X, I saw that warning was written against your name in the ledger of heaven. Wanting in patience. Wanting in forbearance. Wanting in self-control. Wanting in lowliness and meekness. And then she mentions these, the want of these heavenly graces will surely close the gates of heaven against you. Serious, isn't it? I don't know how many of you have any of the testimonies to the church or other of Mrs. White's writings, but I want you to understand something carefully. Some of that you'll see today. If you will carefully and prayerfully read those messages, you will find yourself in there. And you will find a specific message for your circumstance. She's written about many people, many personal letters to personal people, real people in her time where God showed her. And then she wrote and said, God showed me that. And then she proceeds to give the testimony. Now, there are several stories of people, I can recall one, where God gave her a message for this brother, and she took the time to carefully write it out. Sometimes it was very difficult for her to write those things. God has no respect to persons, and he tends to tell it like it is. So she wrote the letter, and she sent it to Brother X. He received the letter return address, E.G. White. I don't want to hear from this lady. And he put it in a box, in a trunk, up in his attic. And proceeded in the lifestyle he was living. Ten years later, looking for something else, he came across the letter now worn and faded with age. And he wondered, well, what did she write to me 10 years ago? And with kind of trembling hands, he opened the letter and he began to read. Now, he had experienced some very difficult times in the last 10 years. And as he read, he saw a description of his life over the past 10 years that could have been avoided had he read the message from God then. What a man sows, he reaps. Every action, good or bad, 
prepares the way for its repetition. How was it in the case of Pharaoh? Bible story this time. But I want you to remember this comment. It says, when a man plants doubts, he will reap doubts. By rejecting the first light and every following ray, Pharaoh went from one degree of hardness of heart to another until the cold, dead forms of the firstborn only checked the, his unbelief and obstinacy for a moment. The Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God didn't make a decree. He can't see. And I'm going to send him a dark cloud so he can't understand. No. Pharaoh decided, I am going to do it my way. And time after time came the place. And time after time, Pharaoh said, oh, I'll do it now. But then, no. And every time he said no, it was easier to say no the next time. We need to do things God's way. He never really gave his life to God. And after he had lost his son and the firstborns of all of Egypt, he determined not to yield to God's way and he continued his willful course until he was overflown or overthrown, overflowed by the Red Sea and he died in the Red Sea. Just what took place in Pharaoh's heart will take place in every soul that neglects to cherish the light and walk promptly in its rays. I have a problem, I don't have a problem, I have a concern. There are people right here, right now, who have not yet committed their lives to Christ completely. And I have a grave concern for their salvation. I know, Pastor. I know doesn't save anyone. Jesus saves us when we give our life unconditionally to Him. We need to make that commitment now. I don't want to hear someone call up the pastor and say, Pastor, I'm so sorry, crying and say, my brother, my cousin, my daughter, my son was just killed in a wreck. And they were just in church last Sabbath. God forbid that should ever take place. You see, God destroys no one. The sinner destroys himself by his own impenitence. I'm going to do it my way. When a person neglects, once neglects to heed the invitation, said in church, they were studying their Bible, and impressed, I need to do this. But no, not today. Another time. Another time I will make that decision. Well, the decision made today is, Lord, no. And when will I have the opportunity to say yes again? There's a story in the Bible of Paul when he was before Agrippa. And he pleaded with him. And his response was, ah, yes, but I'll call you when I have another convenient season. The record doesn't show ever another a convenient season. You see, conscience is the voice of God. Heard amid the conflict of human passions. And when it is resisted, the Spirit of God is grieved. And the Bible says, Paul writing in Ephesians says, We are told by Paul, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That voice called. We need to answer. But I need to rephrase that. When that voice calls, we do answer. Sometimes we say, yes, Lord. More often we say, not now, Lord. Later. We're told by Paul, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, all need to understand how the soul is lost. It is not that God sends out a decree that man shall not be saved. uh uh-uh. It cost him too much to do that. He wants us to be saved. He does not throw out a darkness before the eyes which cannot be penetrated. No. But man at first resists a motion of the Spirit of God. And having once resisted, it is less difficult to do it the second time, and less the third, far less the fourth, and thereafter. Then comes the harvest of resistance. The harvest to be, resist, to be reaped from the seed of, the un, of unbelief and resistance is a very serious one. And she describes it this way, Oh, what a harvest of sinful indulgences is preparing for the sickle. Now, how am I going to protect myself, and how are you going to protect yourself against making that bad choice? It's a daily choice, by the way. I want to stress that point, it's a daily choice. Everybody here ate yesterday. Therefore, you do not need to eat today. Correct? No. We feed on God's word every day, enough for today. The children of Israel had an illustration to them. When the manna fell every day, go out and select what you need, and the, and the instruction was what you need for today. Don't keep it for tomorrow. It's not going to be good tea. And there's always those folks who say, well, I'm going to try. I'm going to do what I want. I don't feel like getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go pick up food. So I'm going to get twice as much today and I'll keep it till tomorrow I can sleep in. The next day the Bible says it stank. Spoiled. So yesterday's time with God is not going to take care of our need of time with God today. Here is the secret. It says when the secret prayer and the reading of the scriptures are neglected today, tomorrow they can be omitted with less remonstrance conscience. There will be a long list of omissions, all for a single grain stone in the soil of the heart. And we become more and more contented not doing what we need to do to stay alive spiritually. Then she makes this comment. On the other hand, every ray of light cherished by and will yield a harvest of light. Every ray of light. I'm studying my Bible. I learned something. I'm going to do this, Lord, with your help. And they're going to know I'm going to be doing better next time. Temptation, once resisted, will give power to more firmly resist the second time. And every new victory gained over self will smooth the way to a higher and nobler triumph. Every victory is a seed stone to eternal life. Do you want eternal life? Are you willing to work for it? You can't earn your way to heaven. But it's going to cost you some time. 
Having experienced victory and joy, Jesus gives. We want to share it with friends and family to experience the same joy that we have. I want you to don't misunderstand what I'm going to say next. I want to read a sentence again. I wrote it out in red so I wouldn't miss it. Having experienced victory and the joy Jesus gives, we want our friends and family to experience the same. That being true, why is it so hard for us to share Jesus with our neighbor, our family? Has Jesus done anything special for you, for me? That's all we have to talk about. What he's done specifically special for me, for you. Tell your neighbor, tell your friends. Better yet, live it. Let them see what Jesus has done for you. When they ask the question, why? Then you point them to Jesus. Lord, he did it. He's doing it. He wants to do it for you too. We render, well, he, Jesus, will render here in Romans chapter 2, verse, I'm going to read that verse. Take your Bibles, go to Romans chapter, chapter 2. We're going to read a few verses there. Notice what it says. Starting with verse 6, I believe it is. Romans 2. He will render to each one according to his works. According to his what? God's going to evaluate us by our works. He doesn't evaluate us by the color of our skin. How high we are, how skinny we are, how fat we are, it doesn't know. That doesn't matter. It's all what we do that he's going to evaluate us by. He will render us, and the Bible says that here, he will render, he will render each of us according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who goes evil, who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. God is not the respect of person. Paul's making it very clear, isn't it? What you sow, you reap. There's a, one of the commandments that make that very clear, and I want to help us to see its application today. It's called the fifth commandment. Now, most of you should know what that says, and when I begin the first part, I'd like you to repeat it with me. It says... Okay, fifth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father what? and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. Now let's see if you can say it together. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. Is that a sow and reap text? Let's see. The family is the most important and fundamental unit of society and the government. Respect for parental authority and obedience to parental law are the foundation of all order and organization. As goes the home, so goes society. 
the nation, and the world. Family relationships constitute the beginning of all human relationships which are set forth in the second division of the Ten Commandments, having been appropriately called the six pillars which uphold the social order of the world. Agree with that? The family is a division, pardon me, the family is a divine institution, having been established by God. Who established the family? God did. All right. In the Garden of Eden, before the entrance of sin. As his representatives, parents are clothed with divine authority to rule the family government. Young people, listen carefully. Next part. Rebellion against mom and dad, rebellion against parental authority is therefore rebellion against God. Be careful how you disobey your parents. Thus the forces of Satan, or the focus of Satan in the great controversy, is the destruction of the family. Is he succeeding? Look at our society today. God's plan for the family is recorded in scripture, father, mother, and the children. That's God's family. The first family ordained by God was Adam, Eve, then Cain and Abel. The children were subject to their parents. A man and a woman each with their assigned function. And for thousands of years, God's plan has worked fairly well. Hasn't it? Fairly well. But in the last days of earth's history, Satan, using men and women under his influence, has sought to change God's plan and institute his variation of what constitutes a home and a family. The result of Satan's plan is described in 2 Timothy. Let's read it, please. 2 Timothy chapter 3. There's a result. What you sow, you reap. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read these first five verses. Chapters 3, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Notice the description of the world based upon the default or the falling apart of the family as it is described here. Notice. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying his power. Is that today? Because the family has been disint disint uh, disintegrated. The application of the golden rule, though, would go a long way in restoring peace in the home. The golden rule applies to both parents and the children. Now, what is the golden rule? Some people don't know. So let me tell you what it is. Jesus gave it to Matthew 12, 7, or 7, 12. Do unto others as you would like for them to do unto you. That's the golden rule. Would you like me to shout at you? No. And don't shout at me. Would you like me to slap you upside the head? No. Then what? Don't slap me upside the head. Like me to twist your ear off? Mom, dad? That used to be. Then don't do that to your children. There are consequences, folks. Notice. As we continue, 
the text here in 2 Corinthians, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I never cease to marvel. Every time I read it, I, I share it with other people. Sometimes I find people on the street, they're, they're talking about whatever. And I have my Bible, I have my phone, if I have the Bible there, I have it on it. And then we get to talking about the world and its attempts. And say, hey, I want you to do something. For me. Read this here. Just these next five verses. That's all it is. Read it, please. They read. Then I ask the question, can you describe today better than that? Not really. God wrote that 2,000 years ago. He knows what's happening. The golden rule of applied would fix a lot of problems. The golden rule applies to both parents and children. Neither perfect enough to deserve all the respect and attention required by the law of God. So we depend upon Jesus and we make the choice, God help me to be nice to everybody. To use a character and conduct unworthy of parents as an excuse. Now some people say, well my mom and dad, or my dad was this, my mom was that, or she was not worth my respect. The Bible doesn't say that. It just says, honor them. I got to do part two, because I have a whole lot more, but I won't finish it all today. It's amazing what's found in this one little verse. Righteousness is a chief reward of children for, for obedience, and reverence is a chief recompense of parents for discipline. Read that again. Righteousness is the chief reward of children for obedience. When children are obedient to their parents, they become righteous or people who do what's right. Most of the time. And reverence is the chief recompense to parents for disciplining. Why did they do what you said? Because you disciplined them. In my mind, one of the worst kinds of Child abuse is not to discipline your child in love. So cute. Disastrous. Notice this next sentence, please. Children who are not controlled and disciplined by their parents while they are young are seldom able to control and discipline themselves when they are grown and they do not respect their parents in old age. Is that practicing today? Continue. The lack of regard for authority, parental, civil, and divine, is the greatest evil of this modern world. The lack of respect. Self-government has largely broken down and is disappoint or disappearing as is evident from the increase of dictatorships in governments on one hand and the disappearance of democratic forms of government on the other hand. Is that becoming part of our country too? What's the cause? The violation of commandment number five. The breakdown of discipline in the home is largely responsible for new forms of autocracy and anarchy that are cursing our modern civilization. It's also the chief cause of the tidal wave of crime and lawlessness that is engulfing the nations, including our own. Lack of discipline. I have, I'll indulge you for another five or six minutes if that's okay. One writer describes it this way. Let your children grow up in homes where there is either no authority or a purely arbitrary authority and you get a generation of lawless people who respect no authority outside themselves and have none within themselves. That is pretty largely 
what you find in my generation. The author writing, I'm just reading what he said here. There was a revolt against the arbitrary harshness of our grandfathers, and as a result, our generation grew up with little or no discipline. And without discipline, it is impossible to live a well-ordered life. But discipline must be imposed. And I tell you a story. I was kind of sick. He was back. Came across his home with a young mother, about 20, 22 years of age. Had a little girl, about two and two and a half years of age. She could just about speak. As we talked together, I learned that she had been married. The father of the child had left, divorced her. And now she was just married or about to marry a second husband. As I continued to visit with the lady, I learned that the reason for the divorce and the reason for the hesitation now on dad number two was her refusal to discipline the little one who ran the house. Husband says, you got to spank her. No, she might hate me. If I remember correctly, I spent about 30 minutes trying to help her understand, if you do not discipline her, she will hate you. God says, spare the rod, spoil the child. He's not suggesting that we beat kids till they can't stand up. He's saying, you speak, you see that they do. Sit down and stay there until I tell you to get up. And when you get up, before I tell you, you're going to sit some more and some more. They'll get the message after a while. You don't have to touch them. If you don't require it, it will never happen. I know I taught school for many years. I never got out of my students what I didn't expect from them, including good morning, Mr. Simmons. God disciplines us because he loves us. Parents discipline their children because they love them. But the child, and please don't miss this, parents, the child must understand and experience that discipline is administered in love because you love them. Another quick story, I was going to Andrews University doing my graduate work at Dr. Murphy, Dr. Murdoch. He was dean of the seminary. His wife was Dr. Murdoch. She was a, psych a clinical psychologist. She did a class in some type of psychology class I had to take. And she told us this story that I applies here, I think, very nicely. She said, you know, I had this, when I was in the school over here, I think she was Southern University at the time, Southern Missionary College that, back then. So I remember a case where a young lady, at the time that she was in school, they required the skirts of the girls to come down just below the knee. That was a requirement to be in school. But many of the girls began to move the skirts up a little bit. They said it would come up just to the knee. And hers was down almost mid-half. So she told her mom, Mom, can you shorten my skirt, please? But dad, well, he... Dad was very strict. And so, mother obliged, and she sewed, so she... Shortened the skirt to just to the knee. And she was contented, went to school, came home. Dad was out of town at the time, and he came back several days later, and she walked in, and her skirt was higher than he said it could be. And he proceeded to whip her and her mom.
And Dr. Murdoch, when she heard about this, because she was teaching there at the time, how does this affect a person, teenager, probably older teenager who's in college, She wondered, but didn't investigate at that time. About five years later, or a little bit more, she was attending camp meeting. And here comes the same girl. Now she had married, and she had a little girl, just three or four years of age, walking down the sidewalk or wherever they were meeting, and they crossed paths. And Dr. Murdoch recognized her, and she said to her, uh, Mary, I don't know her name, can I ask you a question? Yes? Do you remember back when you were in college and you had your skirt shortened by your mom and your dad came back and he found that and he spanked both you and your mother? Yes. How did you react to that? How did you react? How did it affect you? And this was the girl's response. Well, I knew that my dad loved me. And I knew that my dad only would do what he thought was good for me. That's it. No resentment? No. Don't hate your dad? No. What was the key to the non-negative response? She knew her dad loved her. When you discipline your children, make sure they understand you love them. I can tell you stories of myself. Almost done here, so let me tell you one of myself. Is that okay? My dad, may you rest in peace, was kind of like that. I used to tell my mom, and I can remember when I was small, my sisters, was, siblings were small. We wanted to help. Let them help. They may make a mess. Let them help, then help them to clean up. Teach them. And my parents did that. My dad had to wait when I got very little spanking. Maybe I was smart enough to not get it at the same time. I learned the lesson the first time. I don't know. But... This was his process. I did something wrong. I forget what it was. I was in for a spanking strap. I forget what he was going to use. Because he usually used a piece of strap. But first he would sit me down. And then he would begin to explain to me why he was going to spank me. And as he would go through the explanation as to why. And why it was important. How it was going to hurt him. I thought, you're not going to feel the pain. And I often think, I remember thinking back then, I said, I used to think to my dad, just get it over with, give me this back. But he had to explain to me first, you have to understand why you're going to get a spanking. And then he would apply psychology. He used to call it applied psychology. But it worked. I never doubted my dad didn't care for me. I knew he loved, he'd give his life for me. Because of that relationship that we had developed, father and son. Last little bit here, it is for the dis discipline that you have, been, have to endure. This is reading from Hebrews chapter 12, 9 through 11. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as son. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not son. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. 
but he disciplines us for our good. That we may share his holiness for the moment all or the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Is the Bible true? We're going to live by it? We'll be remiss now. As we close, I'd like to invite anybody, not a member of the church, who recognizes Jesus is about to come. Probation is about to close. The part that scares me, I would say, I wouldn't say scare is the right word to use, but concerns me is that when probation closes, the day it closes, I will not. I cannot tell you it's going to be next week, next month, next year. But close it will. And when Jesus stands up in the heavenly courts and says, it's now over. It is done. And his father says, son, who bring my children home. It's going to be a period of time. The sun's going to come up and the sun's going to go down. Life is going to go on as, as it always has. And we'll either be sealed in to God's kingdom or we'll be sealed out of God's kingdom. And at that period, during that period of time, as I understand, Satan will take control of this world in a way he has never up to this point. He's doing a pretty good job today. It'll get worse. But my Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God's going to take care of His children if they accept Him today. So, anybody here not baptized, not a member of the church, and I'm not going to baptize you today. But you want to say, I want to be ready when Jesus comes and I want to plan for that day in the near future. You raise your hand. Maybe better stand up, Jesus. Anybody? Okay. Why did I do that? I've been told, Pastor, I have a responsibility to invite people to give their hearts to Jesus. I thought I just told you, every time you say no, you make it easier to say no tomorrow. If you didn't understand that, I apologize. I have to try it again. Brethren, it's time to stop just coming to church and let's live like God. Okay? He's coming. I want to go home because he died for me and I appreciate it so much. Heavenly Father, here we are. There are some of the seats that are struggling right now. The Holy Spirit is touching their hearts. They knew they have to make some commitment. Some are learning, some are studying, some are just drifting. But as was mentioned in our Sabbath school, we cannot, we will not, we will never drift into heaven. We must make a complete, intelligent, decision. By God's grace, I will allow Jesus to save me. And so I pray for each one here today that have made that decision. You help us to be faithful to our commitment to you. And for those that are in the valley of decision, I need to, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, I'm not sure. Please don't give up on them, Lord. You love them, you died for them, and we know that soon the time to decide is going to pass. Paul said today is the day of salvation. Bless us now. Bless each member, and each potential member, that each of us, and all of us, will have our names inscribed in your Lamb's Book of Life when Jesus comes. So we can be covered with your protecting grace when the problems break loose. 
the angel of the Lord will stand before us to defend us. Thank you for that promise. Help us to believe, Lord, and to believe more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.